Thank you, Jacob. He's not, oh, Jacob has left the building. <laughs> He's actually going upstairs to minister to the kids and lay hands on them. He, he says his goal is to have them all speaking in tongues in a few minutes, so, <laughs> and he'll, he'll do it. Uh, I, I, you know, we've been going north for close to 50 years. We've been helping build churches and uh, helping pastors encourage and going in, having conferences and that. Um, the challenge has been, you know, we go in and it's great. We leave and everything goes back the same. Uh, this project has the potential of transforming entire communities because the, the vision is to raise up an army in that community that will be so equipped to reach their own people. It's, it's the best of the best. And uh, I can tell you, because Jacob has said we were just there uh, just a few days ago and uh, in Cape Dorset and uh, um, the leaders there are so excited. So we met with Hamlet leaders and uh, as well as the church leaders and they're so excited and encouraged. And, uh, and, and yeah, Jacob said, you know, um, if you can't go, don't feel to go. You can do other things. We were in Stratford. We did a conference with John and Carol Arnott uh, July 1st and uh, he was sharing this and uh, John said to me, um, you know, how much does it cost? So I told him, he said, well, uh, and he pointed out a youth pastor there that they have kind of mentored. He said, Carol and I want to send them. And uh, so they they paid for this guy, and he's part of this team. So it's 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 a really great investment, and it is Canada. And um, uh, we thank God, you know, for the vision that's gone. And um, up until now, it's all de- it's centered around and, in, in, you know, dependent on us being there, going, doing, and this doesn't. Um, Jacob or I will not be involved. Um, we've been quite involved, and, and he's been very involved getting this team together. Um, they have to apply. Uh, they have to have pastoral references. They go through an interview. Then we all sit down and go through and approve. And then once they've been doing Zoom calls with the leader of this team, the two leaders of this team for a few weeks now, every week, uh, we were on the first one, Gwen and I sharing the vision and the heart. Jacob's been with them, and now this Inuit gal from Bible College is meeting with them to uh, help them understand cultural things, and uh, uh, because it's an awful thing if people go in and have no sensitivity to the culture. The gospel doesn't change culture, it changes people, transforms people, and uh, and it, it kind of perfects culture, so it's it's... It's just wonderful, and Canada is being saved, and the vision is not just from sea to sea, but from the river to the ends of the earth, and uh, that's exactly what the mission is. If you told me when I, you know, growing up, you're going to be involved in missions and a big part of your life and ministry is going to be missions, I would have been very excited about that, because every missionary I saw showed slides of palm trees and beaches and all of that, and... Um, didn't really turn out that way. Um, our mission is the Arctic, and um, we've been doing a lot in Arctic Russia. Um, you know, at this point, we're not able to do what we want to do there. We actually got our a key worker out um, of Russia uh, just as everything was closing up. He was on one of the planes out with his family, and he's in the United States. And uh, at this point, we can't even get money in to help people go north. It's, uh, Putin is really, he's shut down everything. You know, bank accounts, you can't do PayPal, you can't do anything. And um, uh, so we're believing that's going to change, of course. Uh, but there are people in northern Russia that have got the fire of God on them that we've reached over the years that are still reaching people and still doing it. So that's that's really encouraging. And uh, so we live in a great mission field, and not just the Arctic Canada, but um, right here. I mean, people have come from all over the world, and uh, you reach them, and they're going to reach their own nations. And that's, that's I believe, Canada's set up for this great end-time revival to take healing to the nations, which we believe is a destiny, because when revival fires sweep across Canada... Millions swept in the kingdom of God from other nations. They will immediately reach their nations. 
and um, the whole world will be reached and we can go to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be alive, isn't it? Uh, I felt to start by sharing, this is going back years ago, and the Holy Spirit just brought it to my mind this morning, and it's for some of you perhaps. Um, we were in a service years ago, and at the end of the service, when most people were leaving, there was a lady sitting towards the front, I think, a front seat or second seat, surrounded by other ladies. And uh, they were trying to minister to her, and it didn't seem to be going very well. And some of them were beckoning to me. And uh, they said, can you help this lady? And um, I said, so what's going on? She said, I didn't get anything. I said, what? I mean, it was a glorious service, you know, when people were receiving and people getting healed. And I said, what? I didn't get anything. I came for something. I didn't get anything. And um, she, almost, she pretty well seemed determined she wasn't going to get anything. I mean, I prayed, I prayed really hard for her, and she was just, mm, mm, it's not working. And she left. And I felt really awful. And... I said, God, I don't understand this. Like, what? what? And he showed me a picture. She was sitting there, and right here on the platform, I saw a beautiful, it was a big box gift wrap with a big bow on it with her name on it. And she was sitting right there. And she turned and walked away and said, I didn't get anything. And then my mind went to, Christmas time at our house and you know our kids come in and our grandkids and our great grandkids and there's lots of gifts under the tree with their names on and uh, what, how would you feel if one of your children you had gone to such great effort to get exactly what they wanted and needed and you, you'd prepared it, and you were so excited to give it to them, and you'd wrapped it up in a big bow, and, and well, in my case, you had somebody else wrap it up so it looked nice, with a big bow, and uh, with their name on. And they left. They left it sitting under the tree, and all years, I didn't get anything. He didn't give me anything. The Bible says it gives him great joy to give you the kingdom and the blessings of the kingdom. Like, you know, I know as a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, I get so excited watching them open the gifts and, and, and loving this. You know, uh, my wife has been down in the Lethbridge area and yesterday was at this big birthday party for our two-year-old great-granddaughter, Elsie, and I talked to Gwen before the service. She said, oh, Elsie loved it. She loved being the center of attention. And she loved all the presents. And uh, she loved everybody singing. She kept singing to herself, happy birthday. <laughs> She's having, and, and she opened all the presents. Uh, you cannot possess what you don't pursue. You have to go after this. You know, I, I've been, how many services that... People say in one row, somebody receives an outstanding miracle, a person besides doesn't get anything, and the same anointing, and it's God's will to do it for everybody. But when the anointing is in a house, you need to pull on it. You know, the lady with the issue of blood could have just laid there, say, well, if he wants to heal me, let him come and heal me, and she probably would have died. But she heard Jesus was going by, and she'd heard he was doing things. And she said, I'm going after it. He's got something I need. I'm going to pull it out of him. And she broke all protocol. And, you know, I'm sure people would say, well, like, you're too weak. I mean, you'll die if you go. Well, I'm going to die if I stay. And so she crawled to him. And she actually pulled and it's one thing to feel his power and anointing going through us. He felt power leaving him. She did something that got his attention. And he said, I was just reading this yesterday, and he said, like, who touched me? And the disciples 
like they act like he was stupid sometimes. Like, like everybody's touching you. All the people are around. He said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this wasn't just a touch. Somebody pulled. Somebody pulled on my anointing. I felt virtue. I felt power going out. And he looks down, there's that lady. She oh, it's me. <laughs> she thought she was in trouble. And he said, oh, my. What great faith. What great faith. When Jesus was teaching in the house in Capernaum and the guys carried their friend who was paralyzed, couldn't walk, carried him on the bed, and the only way they could get in is to rip through the roof. And that's rather disruptive, especially if it's your roof. <laughs> I mean, Jesus is teaching the word and stuff starts falling down and looks up. And you see this guy, he lowered him down. They see these four faces looking at him. And the Bible says he saw their faith. And every time I read that, I think, can he see my faith? Faith is something you should be able to see. It's not something we talk about. Not something we boast about. How much faith we've got. I've got more faith than them. It's something that he should be able to see. And he says, I haven't seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. You went after that. You knew. And I think we have to get aggressive in this. This isn't just for today. It's not just for this conference. But it's, it's for life. Go after it. Well, if it's his will. It is his will. Read a copy of the will. <laughs> I can tell you, <laughs> you know, when I pass, I mean, I, my kids aren't going to sit around and say, well, if it was his will to give me anything, I'll get it. They'll say, I'd like, well, I want to see a copy of this will. I want to see what I got here. What did he leave? That's smart. That's smart. We read the will. The Bible is a copy of the will. And by the way, the Bible isn't just New Testament. It's Old and New Testament. He did not come to do away with the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. And you'll never get all that you should get out of the New Testament if you don't know the Old Testament. Because it is God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration by him. And is profitable. It's profitable. All scripture is profitable. And... Um, and so, you know, you, you, we discard a lot of things. Well, that's Old Testament. Well, it's still God's word. It's still God's word. I was teaching on tithing and giving, uh, as I do at times, and uh, a guy came to me afterwards, and he said, um, I don't believe in tithing. Said, oh, really? He said, no, it's Old Testament. Okay. He said, they didn't tithe in the New Testament. I said, oh, really? Because, you know, he seemed to know. I said, no, no, that's Old Testament, I don't do that. And uh, so I said, well, maybe you're right, let's see. So I said, I guess we look at the book of Acts, that's the church, what did they do? And I discovered very quickly, they didn't give 10%. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I said, you know, you're right, they gave 100%, they gave everything, they sold everything. And then he looked nervous and he said, well, I'm not against tithing. I'm just trying to sort it all out. <laughs> all of a sudden, 10% didn't look too, too bad. You know? <laughs> but um, all the promises that God gave to Abraham are ours. They're ours. They're, it's, it's, the word is for us. And, and so, so this is about kingdom life. And it's not just about coming to a conference and getting touched or blessed. And uh, by the way, thank you so much for inviting us. And uh, uh, thank you for embracing Jacob. He, uh, he, he's an outstanding young man. He's, um, he, he's very, very special. And uh, he's, he will be, I believe he'll be Canada's leading evangelist. But he's certainly... A great evangelist now, and he's still in the mentoring stage, and he's still, you know, he's serving, and he's. But he's um, next year. He's going to be doing a lot um, on his own, and uh, uh, 
and we're still going to be walking really closely together. He's his son, and uh, and so you know we're in this together forever. But um, he's got it. He's got the heart. And what? And if you were here this weekend, you know what brought us together over a year and a half ago was the fact that he um, a year and a half ago got the vision that I got 50 years ago. He didn't know about my vision. I didn't know about his. But he saw Canada in revival. He saw he saw a map of Canada with the blood just of Jesus covering the entire nation from the north right down. He saw the things that I saw, stadiums filled across the country and armies of young adults out in the streets. And I've, you know, I saw it. So when you've seen it, you know. I, like I said to him last night, we're talking about revival. We know where this is all going. We know what's going to happen in Canada. We've seen it. We've been there. And when you've seen it, you, it's easy to believe. In fact, you can't not believe when you've seen it. So um, that connected us together. Uh, and he represents um, a, quite an army of young men and women now. And as we've talked about, next week, this coming week, I'll be, we'll be in Moncton, New Brunswick, where there's 100, between 100 and 200, I think, of this type, young, on fire for God, Canadian evangelists that are doing it. They're out on the streets, they're doing it. They're, um, and many of them are getting involved in what we're doing in the North. It's just, just so, so encouraging. So um, anyways, thank you for in, embracing him as you do. You've been very kind to him and I love that. It just blesses me when I see you folks blessing him. And uh, him and his wife are, uh, they're believing for some real big things. And uh, he, they made a lot of sacrifices and he's been away from home a lot. And uh, so thank you, thank you. But I want to, you know, wrap up today, I guess, by doing a couple of things. And um, I was reading in John chapter 14, and this is really kingdom because we've tried to refresh you with what you already know. And pretty well, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun. And, you know, so you, it's so easy sometimes when you hear a truth to kind of fluff it away, say, well, I know that. And what I've found with me was you can have a lot of truth, a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology that is really good, but it's just knowledge. And, and it doesn't change you. When that truth goes from your head to your heart, that's where the passion comes. That transforms you. And transform people, transform people. And so the goal, even this morning, is that every one of us will have a fresh encounter with him that will go from our head to our heart and will be transformed and we become carriers of this thing. I believe with all my heart this is a new season. For the church in Canada, for you, for your families, for your businesses, for our nation, it's a new season. I honestly believe in the last few months there has been a major shift in the realm of the spirit. We've seen some evidence of that, but we're going to see a lot more in the months ahead because it always happens in the spirit before it happens in the natural. And there's already been that shift. But um, uh, Jesus is talking and he's telling them, that uh, he says, he who believes in me, in verse 12 of uh, chapter 14 of John, he said, most assuredly, or I promise you, that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will we do, because I go to my Father. We like that verse. We quote it a lot. We're going to do greater things. We're going to do greater things. But the reality is we're not doing anything near what he did. 
let alone greater things. And so, you know, there are, there's groups that say, well, it can't mean what it says. But everything Jesus did and said was very intentional. And as I said, the difference between the Canadian church and some churches in other nations that are seeing explosive revival that's shaking nations and it's beginning to happen here is that there's a people who believe he is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. They just take the word of God literally. And many have been told you can't take it literally. You know, um, we just did a um, service in Ottawa uh, focusing on Israel. And um, next week, or this coming week, I think Thursday, we'll be in Toronto uh, at an event honoring Stephen Harper for his support to Israel. And uh, there's a real thing in the church um, not to support Israel because they've come up with this, what they call replacement theology. That every time you read any promises or prophecies about Israel, it doesn't mean Israel, it means the church. And if you study a little thing, where did this come from? Well, it came back in the 1940s, around the wartime, when theologians and Christian leaders we're trying to make sense of a good chunk of the Bible that talked about Israel and the promises of Israel, what was going to happen. And there was no Israel. There was no nation of Israel. They'd been dispersed all over the world. The Hebrew language was not in existence. It had died. And... Now, during the war, millions of Jews were being killed. So the conclusion was, there is no way any of that can happen. I mean, because there is no Israel, and, and, and there is no Hebrew language, and, and, you know, so none of that can, it can't mean what it says. So they came up with this idea, well, let's let it make be the church. And that's really a stretch, but this is what they did. This, okay, so, okay, oh, yeah. Then all these promises are for the church. Now, the problem was in 1948, the United Nations recognized a nation of Israel. And the first thing they did was reestablish their language. And all the prophecies were being fulfilled and still are being fulfilled from the nation of Israel. But, but this group had, had been gone so far out there, you know, they would have had to say they made a mistake. <laughs> and God forbid anybody would ever have to admit they made a mistake. So to this day, they still adamantly say, no, it doesn't mean Israel. Because then they say, well, we don't get involved in politics. Supporting Israel has nothing to do with politics. It's got something to do with the Bible. And um, I, I was walking up to the Western Wall, the, some called the Wailing Wall, um, a few years ago. And uh, just walking up to, to pray. And that's where the Jewish people go to pray. And it's the most sacred place for them because the actual blocks of stone in that wall are from the temple. And that's the closest they can get. And so they actually go up and touch and sometimes kiss those stones and put prayer requests in, in the, you know, through the cracks and they pray. So I was going there to pray. And a Jewish man, an older Jewish rabbi man, came and stood right in front of me. And glared at me and said, are you a Jew? And I said, no, sir, I'm a Christian. Why are you here? I said, well, actually, I'm here because I'm a very selfish person. <laughs> really? I said, yes. I said, your scriptures tell me that if I bless Israel, I will be blessed. If I bless your people... I will be blessed. 
And I'm selfish enough to want to live in blessing. So I'm here to pray for Israel and for your people. And I'm here for, to look for ways to bless. And he gave me the biggest hug, <laughs> took me by the arm, and escorted me to the wall and kind of said, go ahead, <laughs> do it. It's a principle. It's a principle. And, and I, know, I know I'm speaking to the choir here because, um, well, as long as your mother's around, you have no option here. You're going <laughs> to... You're going to love Israel. And um, you've been, and you're going to come back. You've got to start working out, because I want you to come hiking with me. Got two years. Well, a year and a half. Okay, okay. Watch him, okay? <laughs> you could be his trainer. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we talk about this. We're going to do greater things. We've missed a part of this. This is the big part. Jesus explains how we're going to do greater things. Because the next thing he says, well, first of all, he says, um, you know, that he, he's, he said, if you love me, he said, whatever you ask in my name, you're going, I'm going to do. If you ask anything in my name, I'm going to do. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We're living in a time when compromise has been the order of the day. There are rules in the kingdom. Well, I don't like rules. I was preaching in northern Quebec years ago, and a good chunk of the crowd was Cree that didn't understand English. And so I had an interpreter interpreting everything I was saying in decree. But there was a portion of the crowd that was French, because it's Quebec, and they didn't understand English. So I had an interpreter on this side interpreting everything into French, which to me seemed kind of complicated, but it worked. Because the anointing was there. Like when I minister with an, an interpreter, I just want them to be under this anointing. Because if they're anointed, I mean, it's terrible when you have an interpreter that isn't anointed. Because, you know, you're... But when they're anointed, you just... I forget I'm being translated. I just... They, we flow. And so I, had, I talked about this. That, you know, there were rules in the kingdom. And I had this amazing illustration. I said, suppose a train is going down the tracks and the train says, I don't want to be on the tracks anymore. I don't want to be restricted by these tracks. Well, several older Cree men, elders, sitting in the front row starts laughing and pointing their finger at me and saying things. And I said to the inter interpreter, what, what, what are they saying? They're telling you that trains can't talk. <laughs> because you see, like missions almost all over the world, um, our illustrations and our humor really doesn't work. <laughs> because we somehow think abstract and they don't. Like I've been... To, uh, you know, people in Russia, the teams we work with in Russia, they'll tell me something. They can hardly tell me for laughing. And it's not even funny. And I'll tell them something really funny and they just look at you. <laughs> so, but they weren't getting this. You know, because I said, suppose the train said, I don't want to be on the tracks. Well, trains can't talk, so. So you think... This white guy that had come to help them from the south would say, okay, forget it. I mean, in one service, I said, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Well, I'm in the Arctic. There are no bushes. <laughs> so the interpreter said, what? I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> that doesn't work here. <laughs> but 
I thought, this is such a good illustration. I'm going to press on. So I said, I know trains can't talk, but just suppose. The train said, I don't want to be restricted by these tracks. Well, they didn't get it. They would just laugh through the whole thing. They thought this was hilarious, that I thought trains could talk. But I'm not in the north. <laughs> you can understand this. The only way for a train to reach its destination is to stay on the tracks. The tracks aren't there to restrict it. The tracks are there to help it fulfill its destiny and get to its destination. If a train leaves the tracks, it'll destroy itself and everything in its path. And that's what people do. There are people all over this area that have left church, have left parents, have left God because we don't want to be restricted. We want to be free. And how's that working? They're bound by drugs and alcohol and sexual perversion and everything else. Because, and they're far from free. The only freedom we can have is following these tracks. There are rules in the kingdom. We talked this weekend about the benefits of the kingdom, but there are also some rules. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I mean, to live in divine health, it's a conditional promise from God. If you do these things, if you listen to my, if you read my word and do my word, I'll keep you in health. We just say, well, I don't want to do that part, but I expect you to do your part. And we do the same with this. Well, you know, I know there are rules. I know I shouldn't do this, but oh well. I mean, we've got to stop saying, oh well. What would it look like if this many people in this area went all out for God? I mean, just all out. They think we're extreme now. They think we're radical, but we're not. We're not. We fit God in. We fit our commitment in you know, to everything else. But what would it look like? What would it be like if we just became so radical that he was first in everything, that we were just, we were Jesus people. We were just living exactly doing whatever he tells us to do. Wouldn't that, that would change the area, that would change the province, would change the country. There was 120 people in an upper room that got filled with the Holy Ghost and fire and came out and they did exactly that. Whatever he told them to do, they did it. At great price. But they turned the world upside down. Our world could be changed and turned upside down by a group of committed people that would do, I mean, they, they learned that at an early stage in their ministry. The very first thing Jesus did was go to a wedding. And in the reception, in the wedding dinner, his mother comes to him. And God bless mothers. She said, son, um, there's an issue here. They run out of wine. And he says, well, it's got nothing to do with me. Now, mothers are mothers. My mother went to heaven years ago, and um, my wife really tried, but gave up fairly quickly to be the mother. So my daughter became my mother. Somebody questioned her about it. He says, you're like his mother. Well, yeah, my mom gave up, so I have to do it. And she's just like Mary. I said, well, that's going to do me. And she just looks at the, she just totally ignores him and looks at the servant. Says, whatever he tells you to do, do. And I'm sure she looked back at him, smiles, and they, I can hear Jesus saying, Mom, it's not like it's not my time. Just do whatever he tells you to do. Well, he's not, he's not going to mess with his mother. It wasn't his time, but he said, oh, go fill the pots up with water. And you know the story. It turned into wine. Amazing. They got that 
right from the beginning. Whatever he tells you to do, do. I found that many things I feel he's telling me to do, I don't know why he wants me to do them. You know, some of you have heard this story years ago. We were in financial difficulty, probably 1976, 77, television across the nation. We had a lot of bills, and um, uh, it was getting worse, it was getting bad. We owed over $200,000, and in those days, it's a lot of money now, but in those days, that was tremendous. And some of the people closest to me said, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to survive this. And uh, I really prayed, and uh, nothing happened. got worse. So I fasted and prayed, nothing happened. I told God, if you give us the money, pay the bills, I'll, I'll, I'll feed the orphans, I'll build orphans, I'll do everything. Because uh, other ministers doing that, it got worse. And sitting in a service one night at a camp meeting, um, God said, take 10%, tell them to take 10% and put back into the camp what they're going to give. And I didn't do that. And... Uh, and went home. And they gave us a lot more. I do this camp every year. I've just preached the 50th year. I've preached this same camp. It's not a large camp. It's a family camp. But my wife was healed there the first year we went. And we make a pilgrimage back and their family. So um, don't go there for the offerings. But, you know, go there because it's like here. We come and we receive. So um, the next day we flew down to Texas and... Um, David Wilkerson, we'd met him and shared a conference with him in, uh, in Pittsburgh, and uh, he'd invited Gwen and I down to spend a week with him and his wife in Texas. They lived there then, and he founded Teen Challenge, and then later, after that, um, the um, Times Square Church. And uh, uh, so we flew down. He meets us in the little airport in Tyler, Texas. I get in beside him in the car. He's driving, and Gwen sits in the back seat, and um, first thing he says, he says, good to have you here. Does your ministry tithe? Well, I said, well, you know, we've just decided to start. <laughs> like I thought, you know, this has to be God. And I didn't want him yanging at me. So we started, did that. And the first thing God told me to do was send $1,000 to Benny Him, And um, I didn't want to do that. And I told God, I don't want to help. I, I won't hurt him, but I don't want to help him that much. And uh, <laughs> so I, we just talked last week. He called, and we're talking about the journey we both had. And, um, and uh, you know, that we went, I went to Catherine Coleman's in 1972. He went in 73. Both of our lives were changed. And, um, you know, our paths went different directions for different reasons. But, uh, uh we we remained friends and and so we we're talking just about the journey and all of this and but i worked through it because giving is always about the heart it's never about money or anything it's about the heart and so send of that and um, didn't know that God was speaking to him about sending me $1,000 because he was in a financial crisis and both of us literally give ourselves out of debt and learned the principles of sowing and reaping that way. But I was in Toronto. Gwen and I were in Toronto probably a month after all this in a hotel in Toronto. Gwen had gone out shopping and uh, um, I was just in the hotel room and I felt Holy Spirit say, go down and sit in the lobby. Well, if you ask God why, he's not going to tell you. So I thought, okay, I can do that. So if you'd stop me and say, where are you going? You're going to sit in the lobby. Why? I don't know. But that's what he's looking for. So I go down and sit in the lobby. I thought, hmm, wonder what's going to happen. It was less than 10 minutes I was sitting there, probably more like five. He walked through the front door, Benny. He lived in Toronto. I don't know why he was there. I never asked him. He probably didn't know why he was there at that hotel. But he looked over, Bill. We came, we hugged, we talked, we went up the room, we prayed together. It sealed something. 
We got to learn that whatever he tells us to do, we do. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. This is part of the key of kingdom life. Like he, he says right there, anything you ask, I'll do. You're going to do greater things than me. This is living kingdom life. But immediately he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's just not, that's not another thought. This is linked to you're going to do greater things than I do. And the reality is, if we really, really love him, we would stop doing a lot of things we're doing. If we really loved him, we would be spending more time with him. If we really, really loved him. And then after that, he says, and this is the same thought, you're going to do greater things than me. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Then he says, I'm going to leave you. Well, this was the worst thing they could have heard. Well, no, you can't leave us. He said, oh, no, if I leave you, it's going to be so much better. Because up until this point, he was only in one place at one time. He said, I'm going to send another just like me. The world will not believe. The world will not know him because the world will not see him. But you will see him because the one I'm sending is going to live inside of you. He's going to live with you. This isn't something you just pick up on a Sunday. It's not something you just pick up once in a while during devotions. He says, I want to do life with you. Yeah. This one come And I didn't get that. You know, I gave my life to Christ. I baptized the Holy Spirit, called to ministry, go to Bible school, and out we do pastoring and and most of what I had was, I, I'd had this experience, but most of what I had was in the head about Holy Spirit until I sat in Catherine Kuhlman's service. And people started not just falling under the power, I mean flying all over the place. Amen. And the Roman Catholic lady beside me that was so assured that I was there to help her because I was a Pentecostal pastor... And she'd never been in a Protestant meeting in her life. And she'd come from Toronto to Pittsburgh because she needed a miracle. When people need miracles, they don't care who you're connected with. They'll go anywhere. If they find out there's power somewhere, I mean, there's a reason that, reason that people are putting so much money to so-called psychics in that because they're trying to tap into supernatural power. And most people can't tell the difference between God's power and devil's power. They come to some churches and there's no power there, so they think, well, that's not it. Because they're not coming to hear ancient history. They're not hear, coming to hear a story. They're coming to have an encounter with a living Christ and have the power flow through their lives. And so she says when this starts happening, she grabs my arm and says, what's she doing to them? Well, I was 27 years of age. So it was a few years ago. And... Uh, I'm ordained with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. I'm pastoring a church. And I knew everything. Oh, they were good days. I could have helped you so much. Now I hardly know anything. The more I see, the less I understand. I just trust him. I do know, I do know a few things. I know he's a good, good father. And I know he does heal. I don't have all the answers. Like... Man, you will never figure this all out. Were they all speaking in tongues? Not yet. Well, why are you here? Why are you here? <laughs> like, <laughs> was it good? I bet it was so good. You'd be the tallest one up there, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, 
and and so I, I was the answer man, so I had to have an answer, and I patted her arm and said, well, this is just the power of God. And she was quite happy about that. She ended up getting healed in that service. But when I said that, he came. Holy Spirit came. I had an encounter that would change my life and path and direction and ministry and family and everything. Our life was so predictable up until that time. We had a nice little family, four little kids. We lived in a nice little parsonage and nice little village and nice little community. And my wife says it was nice but boring, but I'm telling you, you link up with him and you'll never be bored. He came and I felt his finger in my chest saying, yes, this is my power and you've never seen it. You've had a form of godliness and you've denied my power. I started to weep. That was the last thing I ever intended to do, was deny the power of God. I used to preach about those out there that did that. And he's saying, no, you. And I, 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 I've got my head down by my knees, and I'm weeping, I'm sobbing, and, and the lady that I'm supposed to be helping puts her hand on my shoulder. She said, are you all right? And I said, no. She said, can I help you? I said, no. No one can help me. I was weeping because I didn't know him. I realized in that moment, I did not know Holy Spirit. And that offends some people because, they, oh, excuse me, you're baptized in the Spirit, you speak in tongues. Yeah. I met him. I was introduced to him. He gave me a gift. And that was it. I'm done. It was a destination. Being immersed in his power is not a destination, it's launching pad. Right. I realized later that the Apostle Paul, when he had that experience, baptized in Holy Spirit, he spent three and a half years out in the desert learning of Spirit. He wanted to know him. And the cry throughout his ministry, to, even to the end, I want to know you. Because there's so much more. And Jesus said, you will know him. This is kingdom life. If you're going to do the things Jesus did, you have to have a relationship with Holy Spirit. The anointing is not a power, not a force. It's relationship with the third person of the Godhead. He has to become your best friend. And that can only develop as you spend time with him. I was in England and a young man came and said, you were in our church in London last year. I said, oh, okay. And he said, you talked about Holy Spirit. And I decided to pursue him. Because that's what, you can't possess what you don't pursue. And some people try to complicate this and say, oh, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know, when I went to Bible school, I didn't know anybody. But there were a couple of people there, a couple of guys there that looked like really neat guys. And I thought, I, want, I, I need friends. So I want, I want to be their friends. So I pursued them, got to know them, spent time with them, and we became friends. And then I met Gwen. I didn't lock myself in a room and fast and pray. I, I pursued her. Here's, here's the line, uh, this worked for me. Any young guys that need advice? Hey, Gwen, do you want to go to a &W? <laughs> Oh, Oh, that's, that's the line. Yeah. Do you want to write it down? <laughs> you want more? That's no more. That's it. That's, that's, because, you see, <laughs> there was no other fast food places. That was it. And, oh, they were the days. You, most of you have missed it. I had a car. Most guys in the church didn't have a car. You needed a car to go to A&W. Because you didn't go in to eat. There, there were no drive-thrus. 
you parked in the parking lot and put your lights on. And the server comes to your car and takes your order, sometimes on roller skates. They don't do that anymore because of insurance. Yeah. <laughs> and then brings your order, puts a tray on the window, the frosted mugs with root beer, the teen burgers that were this big, and the french fries. That, oh. We were in Saskatchewan years ago. We're going to have revival here, you know. <laughs> I'm speaking to the choir. Now, there, there's some of the younger ones are saying, what, what, what? But I'm speaking to the choir here. Come on, I'm... <laughs> there, there's something on this, you know. <laughs> They're all getting hungry. <laughs> and... So we're in, I think it was Saskatoon, and we're driving from the, we don't really don't eat at night, but we're driving from the church back to the hotel, and I didn't see it. Gwen spotted an a and And she leans over and says, Hey, Bill, you want to go to a &W? <laughs> Well, you can sit in the parking lot all night. You, nobody's coming. You go through this drive through and I ordered, because, you know, we always got the same thing. Two root beer, jumbo, team burgers, fries. They give you the root beer in paper cups. And the team burgers that used to be this big are like this. <laughs> I mean, it just wasn't the same. But all memories, memories. And, and uh, <laughs> so, but I pursued her. I spent time with her. I wanted to get to know her. I listened to her. I, I was still, when I met her, I was, I used to say I was a good Baptist boy. She said, you were not. You were a Baptist boy. <laughs> she, she dropped the good part. <laughs> but I heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Gwen was br brought up Pentecost. I mean, her, uncle, her mother and uncles and aunts were all saved in the Jeffreys Healing Revival in England and then came to Canada and all were in ministry, including her mom. So, I mean, she's a purebred and she knew. So we, we'd go out at night and I'd listen. I'd ask her. She, she would talk. I mean, this was our date. We'd sit in the car and she'd teach me about Holy Spirit, about baptism of Holy Spirit. And then... That same week that I was really hungry for this, I just didn't understand what it was, but I thought if it's more, I want it. Oral Roberts came to Canada, to Toronto, with his tent, 10,000 seat tent. It was one of his last tent meetings. And we went, Gwen and I grew up watching him on black and white television, Sunday afternoons, watching in the tent, the meeting. So we went, traffic jams, getting to the tent. Sat there. 10,000 people inside, 1,000 standing outside. He gets up and says, I'm not going to talk about healing today. I just feel I'm supposed to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Oh. He was going to pray for the sick afterwards, lay hands on hundreds, if not thousands, which he did after every meeting, and until they almost had to carry him out and then do it again the next day. And uh, um, that put so much credibility on I was so thankful just before he passed that we could sit in his home and I could say thank you. Thank you for that message. Thank you for being God. Because it was life changing. And then we left while he was still praying for the sick because we had to get back to church because we, in those days, you felt you'd go to hell if you didn't go to Sunday night service. So our pastor kind of didn't really literally say that, but you. You had to be in church. It wasn't optional. You didn't go once in a while. You didn't go. Any, you went to church. It was the commitment that you made. And, we, and so we went back to church, and the guest speaker said, um, uh, "I'm preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit." And that night I received, and it was life changing. It gave me a hunger for the Word. When you fall in love with Him, you fall in love with the Word. And then, and I tell you, I'm still, I'm still on this process of wanting to know him, but he is my best friend. I just I absolutely love him. He, he makes life so interesting, fascinating. This is, this is kingdom life. 
This is kingdom life. You can know him. It's not just for a select few. And let me wrap up with this. It was really what I was going to preach on this morning, but I don't think I will now, since it's afternoon now. Uh, and, and you have a flight to catch, and there's chicken coming, and, and they want to go to N.W. There, by the way, there's one just down the road, you know. Oh, you know, you know, okay. <laughs> so... A man of God had this vision of seeing this water gushing from the temple. Gushing. It was ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, then waters to swim in. He saw it gushing from the temple. What a prophetic picture. Because Jesus made the decision that he wasn't going to live in buildings anymore. God would not inhabit temples. So he didn't have to go to Jerusalem. He didn't have to go to some mountain. He didn't have to make a pilgrimage anywhere. That our bodies would become the temples of God. To me, that doesn't make any sense. I would think, God, if you were to ask me for advice, that's not a good idea. It's really not a good idea because we know us. But he knew us and he said, I'm going to dwell inside of you. That's what Jesus said. So when he meets the woman at the well, and we've talked about it this week, and you've talked about this week that meets her, he said, if you knew who it was who was asking you, you'd ask me for a drink because the water I give you isn't from this well, it's living water, and it'll be in you like a fountain. This is kingdom life. If the river of God is going to flow in Sylvan Lake, in Red Deer, in Alberta, it's not going to come from up there or down here, up there. Nobody's going to bring it to this place. It's going to come from you. Out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. It's time to let the river flow. Kingdom life. There are some rules, and if we love Him, we'll keep the rules. I mean, if we're unfaithful to Him, you know, like I somebody posted something on Facebook if a wife satisfies their husband, he'll never be unfaithful. That is so stupid. That is so stupid. If a husband loves his wife, he will never, ever be able to be unfaithful. Never. Doesn't matter. You say, but she needs it. It doesn't matter. And Jesus said, you're going to do greater things than these, but if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Let's keep the train on the tracks. It's not going to stifle you. Because Jesus said, you say, but you know, I need, I need this. No, you don't. Jesus said, if you drink enough of this water, you're not going to be thirsty. And some of you are craving pornography or craving this or craving that. You just need to drink from this fountain. And he says, you will not be thirsty. You will be satisfied. Jesus is enough. And the kingdom has a king. And if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And if we love him, we'll know him and we'll walk with him. I would like this to be the day when I literally see literal fire on your head. Like, we've been in some wild meetings. Last night wasn't too dignified. <laughs> but I've never been in a meeting where I've said fire. Now, there's a church just outside Ottawa, the first Pentecostal church building in Canada. When 
I think it was a Wesleyan Methodist, I think, pastor, went from the Ottawa Valley to Azusa Street, got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, came back, I think his last name was McAllister, came back, joined with some ladies praying in a house, revival broke out, ended up building this church, and it's documented, the meetings they had there, it's all there. The building's there. That they literally had meetings where they saw literal fire on their head. You say, well, that can't happen. Well, it did. Read the book. Well, it doesn't mean that. Did you, were you here at the beginning of my message? We take the Bible literally. Well, you can't do that. Well, we do. We do. So, whether I see literal fire or not, the answer is for every one of us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. John says, John says, I baptize you in water, but the one coming after me is going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus talked to him about this. Don't want you to do anything until you receive, you're going to receive power after Holy Spirit comes to you, but go and wait for it. They wouldn't understand what this means. They wouldn't understand what it looks like, what it felt like, what the good things. But they did understand baptism. It's not just a little dab, a little touch, a little blessing. To be baptized by John, you had to go out into the Jordan River. And you were submerged. Jesus was submerged, immersed. Because he came up out of the water. We're in Israel. I baptized Jacob in the Jordan River. Because you wanted to be. You've been baptized again, but I just thought, one more time, Lord. <laughs> Won't hurt him, but that's what you want. And I make sure you, the whole body goes down. I've had people that baptize that, you know, I realized their nose was sticking out. So I'll push them down again. <laughs> Didn't do that with you. But, but you have to, it's immersion. This experience with the Holy Spirit isn't just a little blessing. It's being immersed, overcome, overwhelmed with the fire of God, the power of God, the person of the Holy Spirit. So you're obsessed. We can get so passionate about everything else. Let's get obsessed with him. So we, oh, we can talk about, it. it happened to Paul. I mean, the only way they got news in those days was when somebody came from another place. What's happening over there? What's going on? You know, whether it's sports or weather or what's politically. He says, I don't know anything. I determined I'm not going to talk about anything. All I can talk about is Jesus. What would happen if we got that obsessed? I'll tell you what happened. We'd be doing kingdom life. Yeah. Slip your hands. Why don't we stand for a minute before Pastor John comes? Slip your hands up right now. Oh God, may this not be the end. May this be the beginning of a new season, a new day, a new walk. We want to be immersed. We want to be baptized. We want to be overwhelmed and overcome with your spirit. Holy Spirit, come. I pray for the fire of God to burn in you. I speak healing and freedom for you. May you know we love you. Not by our words, but by our actions. I pray that in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. Uh, is Kristen here? Maybe we just have Kristen and some of the band come. We'll just, just want to worship him. How many received something this morning? I'll tell you, one of the things that we received was an impartation of hunger. Um, you should start getting commissions from A&W, you know what I mean? Uh, but man, wasn't that powerful? You know, one of the things that God really, you know, I think just really just convicted me of too, it's just like, what he tells us to do, just do it immediately. And uh, how many just felt that? It's like, hey, Lord, if you're, if you're calling us to do something, asking us to do something, don't drag your feet, you know, and, oh, okay, we'll get to that, Lord. Like, let's just jump in with both feet, say yes to him today. Um.